Hello? Check. Hey, it worked. Um. <laughs> it's all right. Thanks, uh, all seven of you, for coming. And uh, four or five of you I work with, so I appreciate that. <coughs> um, my name is Christopher Ado. I am uh, Senior Director of Technology Operations for Morph Labs, and I do talks on occasion, and I also make beer. Um, and we, uh, I don't know if you guys are familiar with Morph Labs at all, <clears throat> but we uh, deploy private clouds based on OpenStack, and they are meant to be consumed as an appliance. So we're actually out there in production. We have uh, some real sales out there and some real users on OpenStack, which is kind of fun to be one of the few people selling into the enterprises um, as an appliance and, and actually doing it successfully. Um, and we work with big and small enterprises. And um, one of my, one of parts of my job is uh, to work with the team that takes care of all the environment. So it's important to me that things work really well. Um, and OpenStack has actually been a big help to us uh, in that, especially coming from Eucalyptus. Um, so yay for OpenStack. Um, we started out in 2009 uh, working actually on top of Amazon, offering a platform as a service. Um, and we were one of their earliest really big users. I think at one point we had um, 4,000 customers using our, uh, our service on top of Amazon. And during that, we learned a lot about cloud and learned about what people were looking for with, with respect to cloud, especially and specifically people who wanted a little bit more help with um, infrastructure as a service and with abstracted uh, systems. <clears throat> and we saw that there was a really big opportunity there to offer people the same kind of uh, improvements in, fun in functionality and reliability that you could p potentially get from a infrastructure as a service play like Amazon, except getting that into your own environment uh, on dedicated hardware and in, in a place where you felt like maybe there was better security or at least better control over who had access to what within that environment. Um, so we saw an opportunity and thought maybe we should go for uh, deploying private clouds on Eucalyptus. So at the time, really Eucalyptus was the only thing, uh, the only option uh, short of trying to go on our own and, and build up our own solution. And it seemed like Eucalyptus would be a good foundation for us to build on top of. And, uh, I, who here is really, who is familiar with Eucalyptus? Who has used it or deployed it? Have you guys deployed it and actually used it in production or? Okay. You guys. So if you're familiar with it, you know it's not lightweight. Um, and, and, and to be fair, we have not spent any real time using, uh, I think we're up to 3.1 now, do you know? So there, there, it's, it's gotten better, certainly, and, and they had a long, dark period that they have kind of come out of now, and especially in terms of community involvement and uh, being open and, and moving a little bit quicker with the code. But we were, uh, we would kind of committed ourselves to it and were uh, built on top of it for a while um, and ran into a lot of problems. <clears throat> Some of the problems we ran into were the, uh, the lack of modularity. It was, it really, and I think it still is this way, which is basically kind of a big monolithic thing, and it's not that easy. Uh, it, certainly when we were working with it, it was not easy to add, add on to it unless you built into it. Um, and when we ran into problems, occasionally they were really terrifying or impossible to reproduce. And uh, I personally don't like Java very much, and I find that to be Problems like that, where you have an error that you can never reproduce, but it happens randomly over here or over there, that seems common to Java. I don't know, it's, it's just bad luck, maybe the applications that I've worked with, but uh, that was our experience, and it wasn't fun. <clears throat> and the biggest problem we had was when we would find problems with eucalyptus, we, we'd find bugs, we'd figure out what, the, what was wrong, and we'd write up a fix for it, and we'd implement the fix, and we'd submit the fix upstream, and it would sit. And we'd talk to people, and it would sit. And we'd talk, and it would sit. And we were seeing 
up to a year between um, submission and acceptance of some really critical, important bugs, which led us to, I mean, that was absurd, and that's why we ended up forking it, which was also uh, probably the least bad thing that we could do, but we were kind of stuck, um, and we needed to be able to move a little bit quicker, and um, we were working with NTT at the time, and we wanted to actually collaborate with other people and see if, if we could have some other people helping us fix these bugs off on our own and move a little bit uh, faster on the code base. <clears throat> but that unfortunately got us in a place where we were also starting to make changes to Eucalyptus and drifting further and further away from uh, the trunk and, uh, or from the original stuff that we'd forked from. And after a certain while, it was, basically going to be impossible for us, or nearly impossible for us, to actually merge what we had been working on back into mainline in hopes of um, taking advantage of some of the new things and the fixes that the, the eucalyptus uh, people were introducing. <clears throat> um, one of the other problems that we ran into was totally self-imposed, and that was that w as we had moved away from the um, platforms of service offering on top of Amazon, we realized we had an opportunity to bring that same thing into the private cloud. And uh, we brought it forward, but the reality is if you're trying to offer a lot of platforms of service stuff, you know, a lot of um, different single click deployments for blogs or databases or anything else, that kind of is a full-time job that you could build an entire company around, keeping that stuff up to date and taking care of it. So trying to do that on top of also trying to build and maintain and, and deploy and support our own private cloud became very problematic. Um, and it was, that really wasn't Eucalyptus's fault, it was more of our fault, but uh, problems we ran into, that was one of the biggest ones. And um, we also really were trying to, trying to adjust the product to make it work a little bit better for us and um, it was really hard for us to, to kind of orchestrate the, the cloud and make the cloud work the way we wanted without actually getting into VMs. So there was, it was really hard for us to reliably inject things into the VMs that, uh, that were being launched within the eucalyptus environment, <clears throat> which led us to kind of get more into the environment than we should have been. Uh, like for instance, right now, we have a really solid line uh, outside the environment, so we won't go into a customer VM. Um, we make sure the environment works and make sure it will run just about any VM you can put up there, but we won't go into the VM, and we never should. We never should inject anything in there to meter it or anything else. Any metering should be happening outside, but because we really, we, there were things we wanted to do uh, with respect to measurements and metering and, and some things like that, we actually had to do it in the VMs that were being launched up, uh, launched within Eucalyptus, which was bad. Um, and by the way, especially since there's only a few people here, feel free to interrupt me, raise your hand uh, if you have questions or um, anything along the way. Yes? So when you talk about we, how many developers uh, were involved in there? How many developers at Morph Labs? Uh -huh, at this point, you talked about from... So, what's that? 50, yeah, 50 developers, yeah. So we work, um, I don't, I kind of, uh, in, in an effort to not make this marketing-y, uh, I didn't talk too much about Morph Labs, but we're a, we're based in Manhattan Beach. <clears throat> Our founder is uh, uh, from the Philippines. We have a pretty big office in Manila, and then we also have a sister company that has 200 developers called Exist that we draw from when we need more developers, specifically for our, our company. So right now we're about a 55 person company uh, based in Manhattan Beach, Singapore, Manila, and Tokyo. Um, so that was the, the size of the team and it was uh, challenging. <clears throat> so meanwhile, ass on rack space, hooked up and made a baby. <clears throat> hey. Half the crowd, no, more than half the crowd now works with me. Thanks, guys. <laughs> um, you guys are probably all very familiar with OpenStack, considering you're at the OpenStack uh, Design Summit. Um, 
to what, at this point, we, when OpenStack launched in um, 2010, we were very, very interested and we saw that there was really incredible potential. Um, and so we stayed involved from the, from the beginning. We were doing a lot of testing internally and watching it grow a lot, but at the time, certainly at the beginning and even um, at, at the point of Diablo, we didn't think it was ready enough. It was very close, but it was probably, in terms of Diablo versus Eucalyptus, it probably would have had as many headaches with one or the other. Um, and then earlier this year with, uh, well, actually with Essex uh, development, we saw that Essex was really gonna be the build of OpenStack or the version of OpenStack that was ready for prime time. Um, and we were uh, at the design summits and saw how quickly the community was growing and how passionate the, the people involved with OpenStack were. And we, it was a very, very big difference from what we were seeing in Eucalyptus and in the people involved in Eucalyptus and giving back to it, there was no comparison. Uh, so looking forward, we knew OpenStack was gonna be for us. Um, <clears throat> so we started talking about how, how we were gonna move from Eucalyptus to OpenStack and we had uh, a lot of serious considerations. So like you were asking how many developers we have, that's a finite resource. And if you are really neck deep in trying to keep an existing product working and try and deal with customers who are finding bugs and getting upset about it, it's very, very difficult to step away from that and go you know, change direction without risking losing your existing customers, ruining your name, and, uh, and all that. So, so we, we had some pretty uh, animated conversations within the company about how and when we were gonna do this and whether or not it was the right time for us and the right choice. And <clears throat> unanimously, we all agreed it was the, OpenStack was the right choice. There was a little disagreement on whether or not it was time for us to, to jump to it, but eventually everyone agreed. And um, the last real question was, who's gonna be stuck behind on Eucalyptus to take care of it? And we essentially <clears throat> broke off a tiger team of uh, some of the sharpest people who could really be counted on to fix Eucalyptus stuff and keep it active for however long it was gonna take us to get on to OpenStack. And we hoped we could move pretty quick. Um, we weren't sure if we could and we wanted to insulate ourselves from that risk as much as possible. So <clears throat> in actuality, it only took us about six weeks to tear out the Eucalyptus Foundation and um, move over to OpenStack. As part of that, we moved, we were previously deployed on top of CentOS. Using Zen as our hypervisor, we went to Ubuntu and KVM. Um, we uh, extended the Fog API to support Essex. And in fact, Hunter right here was uh, his team and Hunter were the uh, largely responsible for that and gave that code back to Fog, uh, which is one of the things that we, in terms of OpenStack, we try to give back to the community too. And one of the things we wanted to do is bring more Ruby, uh, Ruby people into OpenStack and kind of expose more people to it because certainly at the beginning of this year, if you talked to almost anyone about OpenStack, it, it was universally Python and everyone only talked about Python and primarily the only developers interested in it were really Python devs. And we were trying to show that <clears throat> a shop like ours, which is primarily uh, Ruby, could use OpenStack and could really make, make pretty good use of it. So uh, Fog API and uh, the, let's see, we're, we're already been using Puppet for years and in fact Puppet was, the, was what we were using for our platform as a service stuff. So um, we used Puppet and that helped us move really quickly on deploying OpenStack in a, in a really reliable way that we felt we could count on for production environments. <coughs> So the foundation uh, came from uh, Puppet Labs. <clears throat> the core of it is actually is from Puppet Forge, and we actually work really closely with uh, Dan and, and uh, Dan Bodhi at, at Puppet Labs, and we work, we're good friends with the Puppet guys. Um, so we we are collaborating with them, especially on the um, some of the Folsom and Grizzly stuff, and trying to uh, bring back some of the changes that we had to make. Uh, more mainstream. <clears throat> so we, we, the foundation was, certainly came from Puppet, but we also had some unique uh, 
um, unique requirements for the way we deploy and uh, and the, you know there may be the difference I think one of the big differences is that we deploy lots and lots of discrete environments um, we're not trying to deploy one massive gigantic OpenStack cloud we're selling and deploying lots of very small OpenStack clouds which we also need to continue to maintain and take care of so it, it changes some of the considerations uh, that you you would exp you know think about when you normally just think about deploying OpenStack. What drove that change? Why not have a single cloud? <clears throat> Wait, what drove? Why not have a single cloud? Or, or like bigger? I mean, you, you said it's like a new building in one of the different towns. Yes. So so we're we're. Is, the question, uh, so the question is, what drove us to deploy um, in a like multiple small environments, right? Because we're selling a and a single tenant solution, and um, we're, it's meant to be deployed in your data center or in your, you know, you, you, know, you own it, you own the hardware. So, you know, we're, we're, not, we're not a data center, exactly. Correct. <clears throat> um, so so one, some of the things that really helped us make this uh, transition possible to also had to do with the, the equipment. It was a good, we, are, we had been working really closely with Dell um, and their solutions team um, for several years. And uh, we were able to get our hands on some of their prototype and, and some of their hardware before it was actually available to the public in order to do our testing of OpenStack on what was going to be the latest and greatest from Dell, which is what we wanted to deploy on. So. <clears throat> We're, you know, we're using a, a 2U box that can support uh, 80 virtual CPU, uh, or V-cores, basically. Three terabytes of Nixenta-backed uh, block storage, and that's ex expandable, um, so you add more 2U units to make your private cloud bigger really easily. Um, so, oh, go ahead. Sorry. Did Nixenta just run under OpenSolaris? Yes. So Nixenta is an open Solaris-based uh, storage appliance, and that sits off on one node or multiple nodes in a, in a larger environment. And we use the Nova Nixenta uh, volume driver to connect to it. So in terms of OpenStack, <clears throat> from within OpenStack with the API or our UI, there's no indication that that block storage is anything special. But on the back end, you can count on it. Um, it's extremely fast and extremely reliable. And Primarily, that's because we're using Nixenta for it. <clears throat> we're based on Essex, um, <clears throat> and we are moving to Folsom, actually, as we speak. Hopefully, within a month or less, we will get all of our environments up on uh, Folsom. Uh, so, yeah, so it took us about six weeks to gut um, eucalyptus out of the equation, and it was brought a lot of um, really nice stuff to the, uh, to the table, but we still had the problem of now our, you know, we had a product that was ready with OpenStack, but we had a bunch of production environments that were deployed on eucalyptus, and uh, we were hoping for some way to migrate them um, we had to and we also we were obviously our own production stuff for our website um, and our internal things like Jira and so on were on our uh, uh, eucalyptus environment that we needed to get them off of so we spent some time um, trying different approaches and really hoping for magic and it turned out that there really was no magic um, we exported VMs and imported them in OpenStack but it turned out for most of these VMs, we were spending more work just trying to fix the VM up and get it to talk, you know, like adding cloud in it and things like that. <clears throat> we were spending more time screwing around with the VM that we'd exported and imported than we would have if we just brought up a fresh Ubuntu 12 VM and installed the, the app on top of it and then worried about transferring the data. So um, there really didn't turn out to be very much magic involved. It was pretty laborious. And 
you know, that was the, the reality check that, uh, as probably everyone in this room knows, once you're deploying an application on, in a cloud environment, it gets really complicated. You have all the, the different considerations around networking, <clears throat> all the different considerations around storage, and how your VMs talk to each other, how many NICs you're, or virtual NICs you're putting in there, VLAN considerations and all that stuff. And going back to what I said earlier about us trying our best to stay out of the VM, we never want to touch a customer VM. We wanted to make this as seamless as possible, but the reality was that there wasn't going to be a seamless transition. Um, so we knew we were going to be doing a ton of hand-holding uh, for, for the process. And, and I apologize if anyone saw the uh, synopsis of this and hoped that you're going to come in here and I was going to tell you a magic command that would actually you know, send something out of eucalyptus and in a glance. I, I don't believe it exists. <clears throat> but if, has anyone, actually let me ask, has anyone here deployed anything on eucalyptus or CloudStack and then moved to OpenStack? Um, I work with a company that, that does, um, that's what they do, it's called River Meadow Software, and they, um, they do migrations from all sorts of clouds to all sorts of other clouds. They actually do physical migrations as well, so mm -hmm. physical to cloud. And they've done OpenStack to, <laughs> sorry, CloudStack to OpenStack, they've done um, AWS to OpenStack, they've done it, uh, Zen Server to AWS, all different combinations. So. Um, I can, you and know. What, what's the experience been like? Um, what the secret sauce is, of course, is that you have to concentrate on the VM. And, and then you have to do so, a little bit. There's some magic secret sauce in, in <laughs> doing the conversion. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, if you know what you're doing, you, you write some scripts around that. So, um, so it's basically, it's a two-step process. It's an extraction, a little secret sauce, and then a, a dump back in. So. Us? Yeah. Um, at this point, we're using raw primarily. Right. Exactly. So, um, you know, what really what we we what we looked at it as is was a data center move. <clears throat> That's kind of how we treated it. So we uh, basically added additional environments for the customers that we were moving to. So <clears throat> we were we doubled up on the environments to an extent, but with a drastically reduced footprint. Um, OpenStack is so much more efficient. Uh, we were able to really deploy comparable, you know, comparable clouds on much smaller, heart, uh, you know, much smaller footprint, really. So the approach basically was to um, give these guys an, an additional environment and then work with them on the transition from the eucalyptus stuff into their new uh, shiny OpenStack environment. Um, and that was kind of how we did it. We did some, um, some scripting and some, we tried to make some of the transition stuff easier, especially around storage, because on the, on the Eucalyptus product, we, our persistent storage was based on NFS. So we had um, every project or cloud that, uh, you know, that you spun up on Eucalyptus would get its own slice of an NFS server for the persistent data mounts. Um, and we were able to make it a little bit, make it kind of easy to expose that directly onto OpenStack so that you could grab that data and copy it over to a block storage device uh, based on Nexenta. So we did a few things like that to make it easier, um, but for the most part, you know, we would either pull the VM out or create a new one that was similarly configured and then help them get the data over and then cut the traffic over to the... Um, I have a question yes. about the... Um how you swung it over. How much data was involved? Was it a small amount or a large amount? Um, under a terabyte for the biggest environment. Okay. So how did you do the data transfer? 
did you you just just ran it over the wire or did you um, basically yes we we had uh, <coughs> 10 gig networking um, between all of the storage stuff and because they, some of these were actually live applications, we would do it um, with the customer during a fixed window, basically pause everything and, uh, or do an initial snapshot and then pause everything and resync it sync. and then swing the traffic. Um, reliability. Uh, I know that NFS, I think before, I mean, basically, it was much easier for us to deploy with Nixen, to deploy block storage on Nixenta with OpenStack and um, make it highly performant versus um, attached, you know, basically connecting to an NFS mount. So, um, what we do, we're, we're using uh, Nixenta. And the storage nodes are all SSD accelerated, so the read cache is on SSD, <coughs> and um, it's connected over 10 gig networking. So you're getting a much, much faster connection that way. At least we're. It was for our use cases. It made a lot more sense to do that versus just trying to set up a big NFS server for each new OpenStack environment. Um, and it also allows people to, you know, with the API to programmatically provision and attach and destroy. Uh, that storage as needed. Uh, <clears throat> so, it's been about six months, I think, since we cut over completely. Uh, and we really love OpenSec. It's been much, much, much better to us. We've, we've had um, certainly problems. Um, <clears throat> like the PTL for Cinder, I think, is John. I don't remember. I was in his session the other day. He was saying, <clears throat> it's not your config, it's a bug. And that's, that's the only kind of thing we run into that's a little frustrating sometimes. We feel like we've got everything right, but then something doesn't work. And we get into deep, and then we, it turns out that it's actually an OpenStack bug. And uh, those situations are getting fewer and fewer, which is great and a really good sign that OpenStack is more and more ready for, for actual honest to God prime time. Um, but in general, OpenStack has been way better to us. Um, we've been much happier and it's worked much better. And so looking forward for uh, more labs, we're, you know, we're working on Folsom, we're looking forward to incorporating some of the stuff in Quantum and uh, some of the really good stuff that's coming up with Cinder. And then also just the, all of the projects that are uh, that are around OpenStack that are offering some really incredible functionality that you're not seeing anywhere else. Any of the other um, open cloud platforms, you know, none of the alternatives are anywhere near as vibrant as OpenStack. There are just nowhere near as many kind of projects and options in the future and being, you know, actively worked on and getting really big companies, Cisco and, and other Rackspace, great big companies throwing everything they've got behind OpenStack. So uh, we're really excited about it. Um, and we're going to continue to increase our involvement with the community uh, in, the, in the months and years to come. And so as everyone else says, we're hiring. Um, <clears throat> if you'd like to send me your resume, I'd appreciate it. And uh, thanks so much for, for coming out. And any questions at all? Any more? It, it depends on the customer. It depends on how savvy they are. So we certainly have some pretty big enterprise customers that are coming to us because they've considered build versus buy, and they realize that their sysadmin staff may be very technically competent, but they have a lot of stuff to do. And they don't have the time to step back and figure out how to manage, how to deploy and manage OpenStack. <clears throat> so we've got a lot of people coming to us with that in mind, basically recognizing that we, we, could, we offer them the potential will be up and running on OpenStack in less than a month um, and in a, in a fully supported deployment. So, and then we also have other people who don't know anything about it and all they know is their CIO said, this is the year for cloud, so we're gonna go cloud this year. Go get a cloud. <coughs> and 
Maybe that's, we get some of that too. Any other questions? Oh, can you, yes. Can you talk about uh, what you may be checking next time? Tell us if uh, we have a box for it. What's mm -hmm. VFS. Is I mean, it's, it's, it's not the only answer, um, but that's the, that's a big piece of it. Um, the other piece is Nexenta, as a corporation, knows what they're doing. Um, and they, they, when we deploy, every, every Nexenta, every storage node comes with a, a supported license from Nexenta. So <clears throat> from a business and strategy perspective, we, we partner with um, Nexenta. We also um, work with Ubuntu. So um, even though the customer doesn't get access to the you know, root level on the, on the server that's hosting their environment, <clears throat> just the same, it comes with enterprise support from Ubuntu. So that we're using the Ubuntu packages and we have, the, we have Nick and, and the other guys at, at Canonical working with us and anytime we need an extra, ex that extra layer of expertise, we can, we can get that help from uh, Canonical. So in terms of storage, uh, Nexenta is probably, in terms of block storage, Nexenta might be the most mature um, and solid offering available right now? Maybe, maybe not. But for us, it seemed like a really good choice. Um, and we'd also, just in our own data center for our own stuff, outside of the Eucalyptus product, we'd been using Nixenta for some time. So we were already pretty comfortable with it. Thanks. All right, thank you everybody so much for, uh, for coming.